and he knew he was about to die. And so he got his closest friends together, his loved ones, and he shared with them his final words. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. It is very simply love each other. And when you do this, you prove to the world that you are my kids. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is literally a helper among us, if you're a follower of Jesus, in us, whose job it is to guide us into all. And as we remain rooted in Jesus, we will bear the fruit of his love. You see, Jesus wants to take us as ugly as we are, as sinful as we are, This is my command. It's three words. Love each other. He just took his entire ministry, three years in the world, rolled it all the way down to three words. Well, good morning, Berean. Morning to those of you who are joining us online as well. My name is Tyler. I have the privilege to serve here as the Family Ministries Director. And I also get to be part of the teaching team. And so I'm so excited to be with you here this morning. It's been a little while since I've been able to be with you here at Green. And this is actually the first time I've given the message here. So I wanted to start off by telling a little story about myself to maybe help you get to know me a little bit better. So you feel like you know who's talking to you and you're not just listening to this strange person you don't know. Is that okay? Yeah? All right. Well, when I was about 12 years old, I was living in the state of Massachusetts at the time, and I was uh, spending time with my best friend, and he lived not that far from the beach. So we decided we were going to go to the beach. It was summertime. It was nice weather out. Uh, his parents were going to drive in their, their van, and they were going to meet us at the beach. We were going to get there ourselves, and the way we were going to get there was by going on scooters. Now, I lived in the woods in the middle of nowhere, basically. And so the scooter I had at home had like miniature bicycle wheels, but he pulled out this scooter with these little tiny uh, road wheels, the, the Razor scooters. Anyone ever seen those? Yeah. So we're going to the beach. We're on the scooters. I'm doing like the little kick motion. We're just going down the road, having a great time. And then we come to this hill right before the beach. I can see the beach at the bottom of the hill. And as we're going down the hill, I kind of pull off to the side of the road a little bit. There are cars coming. I don't want to hit anything. And as I'm going, my back foot kicks the back wheel of the scooter. And I do a face plant in the side of the road. And I have little bits of gravel, gravel in my side right about here. So I'm in a lot of pain. I'm kind of like crying. I'm like, ah, this is so terrible. What's happened to me? I fell off a scooter. And so my friend helps me up. He brings me to the beach. We wait for his parents to get there. They had a first aid kit in their minivan. And they start cleaning out my wound and pulling the little bits of rubble out of my side with tweezers. It was just a mess, let me tell you. But over the summer, as that wound started to heal, I was 12. I had very little impulse control. And I did something you're not supposed to do. I kept scratching at that wound. And the pain that I had there uh, turned into itching, and I kept scratching at it and scratching at it, and it was really bad. It was a mess. Well, at the end of the summer, the wound had finally healed over, but I was left with this white patch about this big on my side, and it's actually still there to this day. I have a pretty big scar on my side. And so I, I tell that story to you because uh, all of us, if we've lived life for a little while, have some sort of scars. For some of you, like me, maybe it was a physical injury that you had that left you with some scarring, or maybe it was for you an emotional scarring issue, something where there was a relationship that wasn't healthy or something that you went through, a loss of a loved one perhaps. But we see our scars or something happens and it triggers our emotional scars and we remember that pain that we went through. So now every time I look down and I see this white patch of tissue on my side, I have this memory of this pain and the suffering that I went through that summer. It was, it was so tragic, let me tell you, but I've gotten over it now, if you couldn't tell. 
We all have these reminders, these scars. If they're, they're physical or emotional, we all have these reminders of pain we've gone through. And if you were here last week, you know uh, that Pastor Ron shared that as followers of Jesus, we're promised that we will go through some trouble, some suffering because of persecution, right? Jesus told his followers that the world hated him and so is going to hate them as well. But even if you're not a follower of Jesus, we all have trouble that we go through as part of living in a world that is fallen, living in a world that's not perfect. And so we go through life with these reminders of pain, and oftentimes we are just waiting for relief to come. I know that summer as I was healing from my wounds, all I could think about is I can't wait until this stupid scab is gone and I don't have this pain in my side anymore. And I don't have it anymore, but I still carry the reminder with me. Most of us are waiting for a chance for our, our pain and our suffering to be washed away. And this summer, we've been going through these seven upper room lessons. And this morning, what we're going to talk about is what Jesus told his disciples, uh, an antidote he gave them, something he said to them to carry with them through the pain and suffering that over the course of 24 hours after he said it, they would forget. And I think it's something that too often all of us forget. And in our own suffering, we ignore what Jesus said. So turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 16. I'm going to be starting in verse 16. It's on page 869 in your chair Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible or you want to give one to a friend, feel free to take that Bible home with you. That's our gift to you this morning. And as I mentioned, all summer long, we've been looking at these seven upper room lessons, right? Well, what we've been calling the seven upper room lessons was really one long lecture that Jesus gave his students, his disciples, his closest followers, that began in the upper room and then continued as they were walking on the path to the garden where Jesus would ultimately be betrayed. And throughout this lecture, there have been a couple of threads, a couple of things that Jesus has been repeating, right? Most good teachers know you have to repeat certain things for your students to get it. I taught uh, second and third grade for a year at a Christian school in Norwich. And let me tell you, I repeated myself a lot when I was doing that. Um, But Jesus has been repeating a couple of different things. He's been uh, repeating the the idea that trials and struggles would come like I talked about. He's also been repeating that he's going to send a comforter, someone to help them through those trials. He's talked about loving one another and following his example of sacrificial service and love. He's talked about sticking with him, remaining with him, despite the persecution that would bring. And now as he comes to the end of his very long lecture that he's been given, Jesus is going to get very pointed about the suffering he's about to go through and his purpose in coming. So pick up with me, if you would, in verse 16. In a little while, you won't see me anymore. But a little while after that, you will see me again. Jesus is preparing his disciples, like I said, for his forthcoming trial, his kind of kangaroo court trial and execution. And it's been in his mind throughout their meal together. And as they've been discussing what's about to take place, Jesus wants them to have something to hold on to, to take in the moment that they're about to live through. He's saying, despite the fact that you won't see me, don't worry. In a little while, you'll see me again. He's giving them hope. Verse 17, some of the disciples asked each other, what does he mean when he says, in a little while, you won't see me, but then you'll see me again, and I'm going to the Father. And what does he mean by a little while? We don't understand. It's funny, the attitude of the disciples here kind of reminds me of uh, road trips as a family. Now, I have uh, two siblings and parents, and we would go on family road trips a lot when I was younger. And there was this question that sometimes myself or usually one of my younger siblings would ask my parents. uh, After a while, we were kind of sick of being on the road and we were kind of tired of being in the car. And we would say, are we there yet? Right? Is this the moment? Are we done? The disciples here kind of remind me of this. They're like, we don't understand why why we're going through this, what he's talking about. And, And the parents' response and my parents' response was always, we'll get there when we get there. I hated that response because I didn't know what that meant. And the disciples are similarly confused. So Jesus is going to clarify a little bit. Uh, Verse 19, Jesus realized they wanted to ask him about it. So he said, "Are are you asking yourselves what I meant? 
I said, in a little while, you won't see me. But a little while after that, you will see me again. I tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn over what is going to happen to me. But the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn to wonderful joy. So Jesus is clarifying a little bit. He's helping his disciples understand that they're going to see him go through torture. They're going to see him undergo immense suffering. And they're going to see the world, meaning everyone who's not a follower of Jesus, be happy about it. His followers had been living with him, working alongside him for three years. They'd grown close with this man. And what they were about to witness, what they were about to see him go through, was going to hurt them deeply. And everyone around them was going to seem to be rejoicing. In fact, the word that the Bible translators translate world here is the same word from which we get the term cosmos. So it's like Jesus is saying to them, it's going to seem to you like the suffering I'm going through is so intense and the entire universe is going to seem to be against me. But your grief is going to suddenly turn to wonderful joy. Now, if you're the disciples, I'm sure you're sitting there and thinking, how in the world am I going to have joy if I'm going to watch you, my close friend of three years, suffer like this? And if everyone is going to be happy about it, how can I have joy in the least? It would not make sense to me if I were one of the disciples. What's with that? Well, Jesus is going to explain how the grief turns into joy in the disciples' lives with a very vivid word picture. Verse 21, it will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. Now, I'll be honest, the first time I read this passage, I missed a little something here, and I'll tell you why I think it is that I missed it. Uh, I'm not a parent, and I have never been in labor. So when it comes to reading about what a woman goes through in labor, I have, like, no idea what that's like. However, I I did a little bit more reading, and and at one point, I I saw something where someone said that it's not just in spite of the pain of labor that brings joy. It is the pain, or the joy that comes from having a baby is a direct result of the painful process that is labor. Moms in the room will tell you, if you don't go through that painful process of labor, you don't have the joy that comes with having a child. So Jesus is sharing with his disciples, the pain you're going to see me go through, yeah, it's bad. And yeah, it's going to seem like everyone's against me. But if I don't go through this painful process, if I don't go through what I'm about to go through, the joy that I'm promising you, the joy I'm telling you, you can have, it won't come. I have to go through this pain. I have to do this if you're going to have that joy. It's not despite the pain that you're going to have joy. It's because of the pain. It's a direct result of this painful process that you're eventually going to have the joy. Watching me going through the suffering I'm about to go through, Jesus is saying to them, is ultimately going to bring you joy. Verse 22, so you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. And then you will rejoice and no one can rob you of that joy. I'm sure that watching Jesus go through his suffering and death on the cross, some of his disciples, I'm sure, must have thought to themselves in that moment, I feel robbed of my joy. I'm sure they felt like their wounds, they had emotional wounds that were being opened and that they were scratching at them and picking at them. I'm sure that in those moments, they felt robbed of their joy. But Jesus' whole point here was that when they saw him again, when they understood the full picture of what he was doing and what God was doing in that moment, then they would have that joy. Verse 23, at that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth. You will ask the Father directly and he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. So if you were here several weeks ago, we had a message on the Holy Spirit, right? And this connects to that. He's saying to them that being connected with God, being rooted in Jesus as we remain in our relationship with Jesus, our desires align with his. And what we ask for is what he would have us ask for, right? So when Jesus is comforting his disciples, he's telling them, yes, you're going to go through suffering. You're going to have to watch me suffer. 
but you're going to have something you didn't have before. You're going to have the ability to go to God directly. In fact, what Jesus did when he came and suffered and died on the cross is he restored the possibility of a direct relationship with God that had been broken since the fall of mankind at the beginning. And the Bible tells us that at the very moment Jesus died, the veil in the Jewish temple, this curtain that was there to represent the separation that existed between God and man, at the moment Jesus died, that curtain was torn in half. I can't say for sure, but I'd like to picture the disciples hearing that story, hearing about how that veil, that curtain was torn in half, and thinking back to this moment where Jesus says to them, you can ask the Father directly. Seeing that what had separated God from man was no longer there. Jesus suffering and dying, his painful process that he was going to go through, brought about the restoration of that relationship. Verse 25. I've spoken of these matters in figures of speech, but soon I will stop speaking figuratively and I will tell you plainly all about the Father. Then you will ask in my name. I'm not saying you will ask, I'm not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf. Throughout the history of the Israelites, the Jewish people, God had appointed special men as prophets and as priests to mediate on behalf of the people, to speak for him to the people and to speak for the people back to him. On the Day of Atonement, the priest would go in and ask forgiveness not only for his sins, but also for the sins of the whole nation. And Moses, on the mountain, he spoke on behalf of the people to God. God had appointed these men as mediators, but Jesus is being clear here. You won't need a mediator anymore. You won't need a, a human go-between. Why? Verse 27, for the Father himself loves you dearly because you love me and believe that I came from God. Their faith in Jesus would be what restored their relationship with God. What was once broken by man's sin would again be made new. And the need for that human go-between would be gone. And between God and man, there could again be peace. Verse 28, yes, I came from the Father into the world. And now I will leave the world and return to the Father. How many of you have kids in the room? Several of you? Okay. How many of you have ever sent your kids for something? Okay, when they come back to you, if you're a parent, what do you assume that that means? That they did what you sent them to do. Now, I will confess, when I was a child, if you were my parent, there were going to be some times you were disappointed if that was your expectation. But Jesus is saying here that his father had sent him into the world and he's going to be returning to his father. He's implying that his purpose, which was larger than anything uh, that the disciples could understand that the, he was sent by God, the creator of the, of the world, who is outside of and bigger than the world, his purpose that God had sent him for would soon be accomplished. He was going to be returning to his father. His job, his mission would be done. Verse 29, then the disciples said, at last you are speaking plainly and not figuratively. Right? Now we understand that you know everything and there's no need to question you. From this, we believe that you came from God. I strike this as kind of funny. The disciples had been with Jesus for three years. This strikes me as kind of funny. Sorry. Uh, the disciples had been with Jesus for three years, and they're like, at last, you're, you're making sense to us. I, I'm just shocked that in three years, they didn't feel like he ever was clear with them before. But during these three years, he'd said a lot of things that had overtaken their notions, taken their worldview, and had turned it on its head. And with, but with everything he had already said to them, and what he was saying to them even now in this moment, Hearing what he was sharing with them, they came to this simple conclusion. He must have come from God. No other rabbi, no other religious leader, no other teacher they had known had ever speak in the way Jesus did. He spoke to them as one who had come as a leader, one who had the authority to say the things he said. And even now with what he's telling them, that he had come from the Father and would be returning to him, that he had this purpose, this mission, they believe what he's saying but it's so funny, Jesus kind of pushes back on them a little bit. He gives them a moment where they're like, mm, really? Are you sure? Look at verse 31. Jesus asked, do you really believe? But the time is coming, and indeed it's here now, when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have told you all this, so that you may have peace in me. 
Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus promises his followers, yeah, while you're here on earth, bad things are going to happen. You're going to have wounds, be they physical or emotional. People living in a fallen world know hurt comes all the time. And as Jesus is later arrested, beaten, and ultimately brought to die a death of a criminal on the cross, his disciples here didn't focus on the last part of what he said, where he said, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And this didn't surprise Jesus, right? In verse 31, he told them, you're going to scatter. You're going to leave me, but it's okay. I still have the father with me. In the moment when Jesus is suffering and dying, his disciples abandon him. They leave him alone. They don't take heart. But you know what's interesting? After they see Jesus again, just like he promised them, after he comes back from the dead and spends time with his disciples, Pastor Ron shared with us last week that historically we know the disciples all went through trials and suffering later on. And after Jesus had returned from the dead and spent some time with him, after they'd seen him and understood the full picture of what Jesus was doing, in those sufferings that would come later in their life, in those trials that they go through, they do take heart. Because at that point, they understand that peace and hope is found in the true victor. That when Jesus came down to earth, when he suffered and died, the painful process he had to go through, just like labor, would bring that eventual joy would bring them the peace and hope that they could have when they went through suffering. Jesus came to have the ultimate victory, to defeat the power of sin and the suffering that that brings. Jesus tells his disciples, take heart, be joyful, because I have overcome the world. And earlier he said to his disciples, when you have the joy that comes from understanding what it is I'm doing, no one can rob you of that joy. You and I, as followers of Jesus today, we can have that same joy, that same peace, that same hope that's found in Jesus because we can take a look at what Scripture says. We can see the picture of Jesus suffering and dying for us to make that bridge between us and God. And we can look at that and take joy. Throughout history, Christians have pointed at the picture of the cross, which in the culture where it came from was a a picture of suffering, a picture of death. And we've pointed to it with joy because we know that what Jesus went through on our behalf ultimately brings us peace with God. It restores that relationship. And in that, we have our ultimate hope. Jesus says, take heart because I've overcome the world. But, But oftentimes, as we go through life, as we go through suffering, as we go through trials, we let the vision of the pain and the hurt that we're going through cloud out the vision of the peace and the hope and the joy that we can have in Jesus. Jesus tells his disciples that no one can rob them of the joy they're going to have, but so often we let our joy go. When I was younger and I would get upset about something that was happening in my life or, or I was mad because I felt like people were picking on me or something would happen like that, my mother would say to me, and my mother knew Jesus and so she trained me to follow him. She would say to me, Tyler, don't let what's happening now rob you of your joy. And I'll be honest, when I was a kid, I didn't like hearing that because I heard it whenever I was upset. But it's so true that the joy we have in Jesus, no one can rob us of, but if we let it go, if we give it away, if we don't hold on to it, then we don't feel it in the times when the pain and suffering comes. We let the vision of the pain, the vision of the things we're going through, crowd out our vision of the cross. It's like we're letting obstacles come between us and seeing what Jesus has done for us. We forget what Jesus said. We don't hear him saying that you don't have to despair. You don't have to be brought down. I have said all these things. I've done all these things so that you can have peace in me. And instead of feeling the peace of God, we end up scratching at our wounds. We end up picking at our scabs and we end up scarring ourselves. But Jesus' words here helped his disciples understand the bigger picture that was at play and that Jesus was doing something bigger than the suffering that they go through. Jesus is doing something in us bigger than the suffering that we're going through. He's allowing us to have a relationship with our creator again. Jesus came and dealt with the source of our suffering. 
He came and made a pathway for us to have a relationship with God again. And when you and I focus on our circumstances and our suffering that we go through, we lose sight of Jesus as our peace and our hope. But Jesus is stronger. He's the one who's the overcomer. He's the true victor. The apostle Paul wrote to the church in Philippi to encourage them with these words. He said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Now, all God has done for us certainly includes sending his only son to suffer and die on a cross for us, to take that punishment for us. And when we do that, when we thank God for what he's done, when we keep that in mind, look what Paul says happens. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Paul here is echoing what Jesus had said to his disciples before, that the peace we can have because of him, the joy that they would have in seeing what he had done, no one would be able to rob them of that. It will guard our hearts and our minds as we live in Christ Jesus. He echoes that words. You and I can pray, asking God to help us have peace like Paul talks about as we go through our suffering. And we can praise him for what he has done, like we've already done this morning with the songs we sang. Thanking God for sending his son to die on the cross. We can focus on Jesus and recognize the end of our story. Because unlike the disciples, the night that Jesus died, we know how it ends. We can look at scripture and see that Jesus came to deal with the source of sin, to deal with that pain and suffering. And we know that he promised he's coming again. So we can look at the end of our story and have that joy. We can look at a world where we will go through suffering, where we will go through pain and recognize that what scripture says in the end our pain and suffering will be no more. One day, Jesus said, when he comes back, he's going to deal with our immediate pain and suffering. He already dealt with its source. But scripture tells us in the end, those of us who follow Jesus, those of us who've embraced and accepted him, he will wipe every tear from our eyes. Think about that. God himself, Jesus, God in the flesh, who came down to earth and already suffered so much for us, At the very end of our story, he's literally going to take the tears we're crying and wipe them away. It's so beautiful to think about that he loves us that much that he not only dealt with the source of our suffering now, in the future he's going to deal with all pain and suffering and it will be gone. And you and I can look ahead to that day with joy that no one can rob us of. This morning, if you're here, and you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with him, I implore you, embrace Jesus. He will give you true peace. The peace that Paul talks about, the peace that passes all understanding. He wants you to accept the gift of his sacrifice that he gave and to have peace with God. If you're here this morning and you've been following Jesus before, maybe you've been following him for a while, but you feel your pain and your suffering crowding out your view of huge, your view of who Jesus is, I want to encourage you, please entrust the difficulties you go through to God. Trust him with the difficulties you go through. He cares about them. Paul encourages us to pray to God and ask him for what we need. Jesus told us to go to God directly. We don't have a need for a human mediator anymore. We can pray to God directly. And whatever you're going through in your life, the suffering and pain you're going through, maybe it's a big thing right now for you, Maybe you're dealing with a loss or maybe it's just a little thing. God cares about it all. Trust God with your difficulties as you go through life. It's so easy for us to just live our lives and miss the bigger picture, just like the disciples did on that night when Jesus was betrayed. You know, they didn't see the little threads that had been woven into what his lecture, all pointing to the fact that the suffering he was about to go through would in the end bring about the end of animosity between man and God. The source of the suffering would in the end be dealt with. What if you and I, instead of missing the bigger picture as we go through life, we pointed to it? What if the next time God calls us to step up and to stand in the midst of persecution like we talked about last week, we looked at the cross and we just said, thank you, Jesus, for giving me the opportunity to exercise my faith. 
What if the next time God calls us maybe to grow and cut something out of our life in that pruning process like we talked about earlier in this series? We said, thank you, Jesus, for restoring a relationship between me and God at all, let alone letting me grow and have a deeper one with him. What if we chose to trust God with our difficulties and accept that peace? We didn't let anything rob us of our joy. We didn't give it away. But we held on to that joy that Jesus promised us, looking to the end of our story, knowing that Jesus ultimately came as the true victor to give us peace and hope. I believe if we embrace the reality of Jesus as the true victor and become followers who look to the future, We will experience God's peace. We will experience the peace that passes understanding that Paul talked about. And ultimately, as we trust the difficulties that we face to God, we can know that Jesus has already come. He is that true victor. He's dealt with the source of our pain and suffering. He can carry us through the things we have to go through. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I know a lot of us go through different challenges in life. I said earlier, all of us carry some sort of scars. We look at our reminders and we know that we are going to go through pain and suffering. But God promised us true peace that comes when we accept his son, Jesus. I said this already earlier, but if you don't know him, if you're not a follower of Jesus this morning, I just ask you, what holds you back from having a relationship with God. Jesus came down to earth. He lived a perfect life that we could not live. He died on the cross to bear the punishment for the wrong things we do, the sin that in our lives that separates us from God. This morning, I pray, please embrace Jesus. For those of us who've been following Jesus, we know that trials and hard times come. But oftentimes we let those things crowd out Jesus on the cross. And for thousands of years, Christians have looked at the cross and known that that's where their source of joy came from. This morning, please embrace that joy. Don't let your circumstances rob you of it. Heavenly Father, I pray for us this morning that as we go from here, as we walk into our week, we would continue to follow you, the true victor who brought us peace and hope, who brought us the joy that no one can rob us of. Help us to continue to seek after you, to go back to you when we feel drained of joy, when we feel like we have no hope and we feel like our world is just in turmoil and there is no peace. Lead us back to you, the source of that peace and hope. Amen.